Homocysteine increases during aging. So let's check out that data. So here we've got plasma levels of homocysteine plotted on the y-axis against age on the x. And more specifically, the age range goes from 12-year-olds all the way up to older than 80-year-olds. And here we can see the age-related increase for homocysteine, first for men and then also for women. Now note that youth, uh, homocysteine levels in youth are around 7 micromolar, whereas they increase to about 12 micromolar in older than 80-year-olds, at least in this study. Now the reference range, at least defined by Questlab, is a homocysteine level less than 11.4 micromolar as potentially being optimal. Now if we put that line for 11.4 micromolar on this graph, we can see that by only focusing on the reference range, we would miss the age-related increase for homocysteine until 60, year olds, 60 years old for men and 70 years old for women. All right, so what about older than 80 years? How does homocysteine look in people that are older than 80? And here we're looking at a study of more than 1,700 centenarians, so people that ha had a median age of 100 years. And here we can see that serum HCY, so serum levels of homocysteine, were 23.1 micromolar, which would be even further off the chart when compared with the data that I just presented. In other words, if we live long enough, we may all have elevated homocysteine. Now, homocysteine is also important because all-cause mortality risk increases as homocysteine increases. And we can see that here in an all uh, meta analysis of six studies that looked at all cause mortality risks association with circulating levels of homocysteine. So on the y axis, we've got relative risk or relative risk for all cause mortality, relative risk, relative risk for risk of death for all causes, plotted against homocysteine, circulating levels of hom homocysteine on the x. So when putting a hazard ratio of one on this graph, we can see the, by the red line that as homocysteine levels increase, all-cause mortality risk is similarly increased. Now, note that all-cause mortality risk also increases at very low levels of homocysteine, or at least it's associated with uh, uh, very low levels of homocysteine are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So in other words, as low as possible for homocysteine may be optimal, at least in terms of all-cause mortality risk. Now, investigating further, elevated homocysteine, which is defined as having homocysteine greater than 15 micromolar, is it associated with the adverse health and or function of many organ systems. And we can see that here. So starting with homocysteine in the center with greater than 15 micromolar being defined as elevated homocysteine, we can see that that's associated with adverse health and or function of the cardiovascular system, of the brain, of eyes and ears, of the female reproductive apparatus, of the pancreas, bone, and kidney. So with that in mind, what's my data? So I have homocysteine data that goes back to 2005, so I have 29 blood tests over that span. And when I first started tracking, this was from 2005 to 2009, I tested six times over that time period, and my average homocysteine was 7.1 micromolar, so relatively youthful values when I was in my early to mid-30s. Uh, and then I took about eight years off from measuring it because it's not commonly measured on a standard chem panel, at least in the United States. So when I started measuring again in 2017, I started measuring a lot more often. So I have 23 blood tests since 2017. And my average homocysteine over that period is 10.2 micromolar. Now, besides just looking at averages between two different time periods, I compared them with a two sample t-test. And when I did that, we can see that these two groups of data are significantly different. In other words, I've experienced an age-related increase for homocysteine. So this is going in the wrong direction. So with that in mind, how can I reduce homocysteine? So to answer that question, let's have a look at homocysteine metabolism. And that's what we can see here. And there's a lot of data uh, uh, on this diagram. So let's break it down piece by piece. So first, homocysteine levels can be decreased by a variety of ways. Starting with dietary folic acid, that's then metabolized into serum levels of folate. Serum levels of folate in conjunction with vitamin B12 combined with homocysteine to convert it into methionine. Now also note that dietary intake of betaine, also known as trimethylglycine, can combine with homocysteine to also reduce homocysteine levels, thereby forming methionine. However, methionine, that increase in methionine will then be converted into S-adenosyl methionine or SAM which will then be converted into S-adenosyl homocysteine, SAH, and then S-adenosyl homocysteine is converted back to homocysteine. So this is basically a futile cycle, even with adequate levels of folate, B12, and or betaine. 
So even in the presence of these three uh, vitamins, folate B12 and betaine, adequate B6, vitamin B6, and the amino acid serine are required to reduce homocysteine. And we can see that here. So when homocysteine combines with serine in the presence of adequate levels of vitamin B6, that uh, is, uh, cystothi cystothionine is then formed, thereby reducing homocysteine levels. So with that in mind, with that in mind, what were my levels, what was limiting in terms of homocysteine in my data? Is it B12? Is it folic acid? Is it uh, betaine, B6, or something else? So for blood test number seven, which I took two, two weeks ago, blood test number seven in 2022, my average daily intake, as we all know, I weigh everything, weigh all my food. I've been doing that since 2015. So I know my average daily intake of all my macros, micros, and individual food amounts. My average daily intake of folate B12 and B6 is shown here. So to put that into perspective, we can pull up the RDA for each of these vitamins, and then we can see that I'm significantly above the RDA for each of these three vitamins, folate B12 and B6. So my folate intake is 2.5 fold higher than the RDA. B12 is about five times higher, and B6 is about two times higher. In other words, none of these vitamins are deficient. So is it possible that the uh, levels of the amino acid serine could be suboptimal, thereby allowing homocysteine to accumulate? And also, another, that raises another question. Will glycine supplementation increase the amino acid serine, thereby reducing homocysteine? So why glycine? So to address that question, let's take a look at another diagram. In this case, uh, a few of glycine's metabolic pathways that it's involved in. So here we can see glycine, which is at the center of that. And glycine is converted by one enzymatic reaction into serine. And then serine combines with homocysteine, as I just mentioned, to form cystothionine. Now, cystothionine is one enzymatic reaction away from forming the amino acid cysteine. And that's important because cysteine is one of glutathione's three component amino acids. And cysteine can then be incorporated into glutathione by supplementing with glycine. But then also, glycine is a component of glutathione too. So by supplementing with glycine, uh, glutathione levels may be boosted while also reducing homocysteine levels, which is what I've indicated here. So supplementing with glycine may not only reduce homocysteine via its conversion to serine, but it may boost GSH or glutathione synthesis too. So will that actually be true? Uh, so I started supplementing with uh, glycine in mid December, uh, December 15th of 2022, and my first blood test of 2023 will be sometime in mid to late January. Uh, so I, just as a last note on this, I think it's inter interesting because many people think that I'm anti-supplements, but I'm not. I prefer targeted supplementation. And uh, based on what I've shown in this video, I think there's a good rationale to supplement with glycine. Now I'll pin in the comments why I'm going to start off with two grams, where I got that amount from. So if you're interested in that, check it out. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested with those links in the video's description. So we've got discount links for epigenetic testing to test your oral microbiome composition, to uh, measure at-home blood testing, to use at-home blood testing to measure a panel of biomarkers, uh, diet tracking, we've got a discount link for that. Or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me a Coffee. Now, we also have merch, which is shown here, and all of these links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.